Hallelujah. We're going to jump right into this. Um, first off, I'd like to thank my Heavenly Father for just the, the foresight that he just seen that where we came from to where we're at now. It's all about his grace. And then I'd like to thank my pastors for the opportunity to minister to his sheep and to stand behind his pulpit. Um, I have been given the privilege to minister over God's tithe and your offering. Uh, so if you guys will go with me, we're going to jump right into this to Psalms 89, verse 34. Uh, I love this is the year of expectations, so how better than to build your expectations on God's covenant? Uh, and this is some strong words, of course, it's coming from my father. And it says, my covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Now, he starts off with saying, my covenant. And we all know this from the covenant that he made with Abraham, where the pieces were broken, and he walked through the pieces. Blessings, saying what he was going to do. But we have to also look at this and see that we know that when God speaks, it's eternal. It's not just for that point in time. It's eternal. So when God was speaking this to Abraham, he had us in mind. He already had everything completely planned out. Now, there's no way around this. This covenant that God made with Abraham is also talking about finances. Because it takes financial dominion. But see, you first must understand the covenant that it provides for it. Now, You've heard of God's covenant with his children. But see, here's the thing to get your expectations up. Do we receive it? Or do we look at it, some people look at it as, well, that was for Abraham's time. That doesn't concern us, but it does. Like I said, it is eternal. Now, see, some people think of it as far off because it's Old Testament times, and that is irrelevant for what you hear now. And see, this is what we need to be careful of, because this is why so many people get hung up in the areas of finances, because they're not taking dominion. They're not understanding the covenant. Because see, once you become covenant-minded, Matthew 6.33 comes more into effect. Because now, once you become covenant-minded, you're seeking first the kingdom and all his righteousness. Well, his righteousness is covenant. It's all throughout the Bible. Speaking of covenant, I, I was researching this, and religion calls it a contract, which if you look at a contract and a will, I hate to say it, but if you look at a contract, a contract is flawed. Why? Because man has found loopholes. Any kind of contract that you get or you put together, men sit together and they write it out. But then once you go to court, you have somebody smarter than the guy that wrote the contract. And so now there's all kind of loopholes. So then what happens? The contract is null and void. Well, family, we have a contract right here that's flawless. Because you know why? And I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me wait. Let me bag up. All right. This is why so many people get hung up on the areas of finances. This is exactly what Satan wants, because if he can get you to not believe in the, con in the covenant, that's where he gets you. Okay? So, what is the covenant between you and God? The covenant you have with God is much more than a promise. It is written and sealed in blood. 
It is irrevocable. It's an agreement. Now, see, look at this. God first established it with Abram. He promised to make Abram the father of many nations. God gave him a great deal of land as an inheritance, but it's much more than that. And, of course, we can read that in Deuteronomy 28. Now, to make sure Abram knew this was absolute and unbreakable, God made a covenant with him, which was considered very serious in Abraham's day. Now, if we look at the covenant from Abraham's day, it was very serious. You pretty much, you and whoever you was making the covenant with shed blood. That's why it's called a blood covenant. Now, within that covenant, you would, one party would announce what they're going to do versus what this party was going to do. If any part of that covenant was broken, whatever generation, whatever family did not break the covenant, they could wipe out four generations until they thought it was okay. That's how serious covenants were back in Abraham's day. You're making a covenant with me. That lets me know that you know what you're doing, and you're not going to break this. So that's why God made that covenant with Abraham. Now, you think the covenant was meant for Abraham, but how do you know that it was meant for you? Let's look at this. Let's go to Galatians. Chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Hallelujah. Now, we look at this where it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. 14. Here we go. That the blessings of Abraham, the covenant that God made with Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise. Now, when you look at promise, say promise, you say covenant. Because that's exactly what it is. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, so the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise. God sealed his covenant with us through the blood of his son. That makes the agreement is binding and it is forever. Now, does anybody know uh, Bishop David Oyudipo? He was, uh, he's uh, in Africa, but he was also a student of Brother Copeland. Now, I thought this was interesting. He explains the covenant this way. It is a deal enacted by God based on well-defined terms and sealed with an oath by God. It was made by God. It was sealed by God. Because remember, he said he swore by nobody greater but himself. He could find nobody greater. So while he was walking through those pieces, he was swearing by his own self. I love that. Our Father God created such a covenant that he's the one that, you know what, there's nobody that's going to be able to break this. <laughs> nobody. No man, no demon, nobody's going to be able to break this because it's going to be everlasting. So it's sealed with the blood of his son. That makes the agreement binding and forever. Now, when we read the Bible, we see that it is a book of covenants. See, now I'm caught up. <laughs> that allows us to access everything we need, including prosperity and financial dominion. Now, I was asking a, a way to illustrate this. Now, we all know for us, if you have a will, that the will is written, but in order for the will to become active, that person has to die. Okay, 
So the Father and Jesus believe so much in this covenant that we all know Jesus came and he died so we can have it. He went to hell and defeated the enemy. Me and my wife have taught the kids this, that Colossians 2.15 says that he was disarmed. So Jesus, our Lord and Savior, not only knew about the covenant that his father, now our father, created, but he went and dealt with the person that had the ability to stop it or to not stop it, but to, Lord, what's the right word to use? Hinder. Thank you. Jesus went to hell, dealt with him. And then, not only did he do that, he went to heaven, put his blood on the mercy seat, then came back so that he could look over the will that him and his father initiated. Now, see, that right there, and once again, I got ahead of myself, that's in Hebrews 9, 12. Let's look at that. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, because this is where it states to that. Hallelujah. Now, we go all the way down. Let's jump down to verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. By means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of, there it is again, covenant of the eternal inheritance. So, now, now, we look at this, and your expectation has to increase because the covenant, you have God, the Father, who made the covenant, you have Jesus, who came and sealed the covenant, and now you have the Holy Spirit that if there's any help that is needed to find whatever answer you need in the covenant, you have the master teacher. Because, see, here, here's how this works, family. If you have a contract for us with a house or anything, what are you going to do? You're going to examine the contract. You're going to look through it, and you're going to find anything that's needed and if something is wrong, what's the first thing you do? No, 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 no. This is supposed to be like this. So when we're looking at finances, and I'll end with this. When we're looking at finances, when we're looking at anything dealing with healing or anything pertaining to the word, what's the first thing we have to do? First off, we have to get our expectations up on what does the covenant say. Two, we go find our answers. Once we do that, we let the enemy know that he has to step back because we're advancing, our expectations are up, and that, family, is what is just a small part of being kingdom covenant-minded. So with the gentlemen come, we're going to uh, pass out the seed packets. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you what, learning more about the covenant has really broadened the expectations of just what God has in store for us. Yes. And I would really, I would really say, family, just uh, as this year goes on, take time to reread re the covenant. Reread what God did with Abraham. It would enlighten some things. Come on, guys. And for the sake of time, we're going to forego our benefits. When the gentleman are in place, just come rejoicing. Hallelujah. Um, 
getting to know what is expected of me from God to be able to come up and teach. It's, it's been real exciting. I was diving into this, and, and I'll get into that here in a minute, but I was diving into this, and it just, everything was coming so fast, and it felt so good. I was like, oh, I'm getting overwhelmed with this, but no, wait, I can get this, and I'm trying to write, and I don't write neat at all. So I had to go back and try to figure out what my interpretation of what he said to me was, and I'm like, this isn't good. So, <laughs> But anyway, but I do want to thank my pastors for this opportunity to, uh, to be before you tonight. So how did I get here tonight? Well, last Wednesday, I was training a driver. You all know I do that for a living, how to drive triples. Now, triples are those really long sets that you see going down, the two long ones or those three pups, and if you're behind it, it's kind of wiggling. You're like, I need to get around this guy because this is not good. Amen. So we're driving, and I'm just finishing up, and I'm talking about you know, what methods you need to do and what the difference is between the types of equipment and what the different elements can do, how fast you're going, what the wind's like, what the weather's like, and all of that makes a difference on your pulling this equipment. And I'd been talking for a good five, ten minutes, and I figured it was about time for me just to be quiet and let him figure out what he was doing because I was making him nervous. I can kind of see he's like, uh, okay, just shut up and let me drive for a minute. So I said, okay. So I let him go. So I'm sitting there, and I hear something come across, and I was like, I knew it wasn't from him. So I heard something, and it was fear or fearless. It's your choice. So I was like, okay, why is that hitting me right now? Well, I mean, he has, I mean, I know he's a little shaken up, but I don't think I need to really, you know, cast anything out of him because he's fear, you know, but I was like, what, what is that all about? So I, I just stopped and I listened, but nothing else came. So I was like, okay, why was that there? Why, why am I getting this? Well, I get back to the building and about two hours later, during our lunch break, I get a text from pastor and asking, are you available to teach? next Wednesday. So right then and there, I was like, okay, the Spirit's telling me this is what you're going to teach on and this is what you're going to go for. So tonight we're going to talk, it's going to kind of have a double, double meaning going into one thing, but we are going to talk tonight about fear or fearless. The choice is yours. Now when I speak about fearless, I'm actually going to kind of twist that a little bit to boldness because I think that is something that needs to be brought to people's attention when it comes to the topic that I'm going to talk about. So when I first started getting into this, okay, what, what do I need to do? Where, where do I need to start? And the Lord took me to Psalms 118. So we're going to open our Bibles to 118. Now before we read this, I want to define the word fear. Fear as a noun is an unpleasant emotion that's caused by belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain, or a threat. As a verb, is to be afraid of someone or something as like to being dangerous, painful, or threatening. So in Psalms 118, we're going to read verse 6. It's a one sentence, but it's going to sum up exactly where we're going to go with this. It says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Amen. So this first statement is going to tie in a little bit later, but it's kind of a prelude to where we're going. We must tell people that the Lord is on their side. Religion has taught that God puts you in situations to punish you or to get your attention. Um, for example, Rusty comes over to mow the yard at the church, as you guys know. So he's out mowing. God's not sitting up there going, yeah, he's doing a good job. That's good. Did he miss that section? Did, did he miss that section? Notice that section. Wait until he gets over to that tree, and I'm going to have one of those branches fall and hit him in the head to teach him to not miss that section again. God's not doing that, folks. All right? <laughs> God's not going to try to knock some sense into you because you missed a section or you missed it somewhere. Okay? 
He is not going to punish you or harm you to get his points across. All right? See, God created man so that he would have a family. All right? He wants us to be with him. He created man in his own image. He gave everything from the inside himself and provided all that they and their descendants would ever need. Just like my brother in Christ Anthony was talking about the covenant. He swore of no one greater than him. He had to do that. All right? I like how that tied in. That was good. God gave man dominion over the world, and God created that world, and then God invited him to fellowship with him on his level. Okay? Now, where it went bad for us all is Adam and Eve sinned against that. And they joined a new, an evil, and a terroristic God, as we all know that is Satan. God had planned to be in place to rescue us from this bondage. So he already had a plan. He knew it was going to happen. He has a plan for us. What was that plan? God sent Jesus. Absolutely right. Which, Jesus is a part of God. Because they're all one. And he sent him to die as a spotless sacrifice to satisfy and pay for the price of man's salvation. Jesus paid for us to receive an eternal freedom for, uh, from the, uh, the bondage of sin, sickness, disease, poverty, death, and fear. Now, we're going to turn over to Isaiah 43, and I want to show that God has commanded us not to fear. Isaiah 43, we're going to read verses 1 through 3, and then we'll read verses 6 as well. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. So right there, he's stating, and you can put your name in there for Jacob if you want. I don't think that would damage the scripture any means, by any means. Amen. He created you, so there's no reason to fear at this point. All right, I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. And this one I really like here. You're mine. So he is possessing you at that point. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he just became, you just became his possession. And you also possessed him because now he is in you. Okay? Verse 2. When thou passest through the water, I will be with thee. And through the rivers shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flames kindle upon you. He gives multiple examples of what could happen to you, but he's not going to let that happen. Okay? He's our protector. He's our guide. He's our savior. He won't let that happen to us. Verse 3. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. When you look at fear and all of its description, but then you turn and look at what God is, and we all know God is love. There is no fear in God's love. Okay? Fear is a tool of Satan. He uses it even in just subtle ways to keep us from our Lord. Many examples, but let, let's start off scary movies. All right? Subtle, it's supposed to be set up as entertainment. The world sees it. Oh, I want to go see that movie. And it's like, and they get excited because they get scared. And I was like, that is not it. That is a way to get your mind off of the word. Even if it's for two hours. But now he's setting himself up. He's like, okay, I got him on that movie. I can get more on them. I can get into the door. They've opened that door. Now I can go in. Haunted houses is another example. People go to that. They pay money 
to have fear put into them. And I did it once, never liked it. And that was a long time ago. That was before I really realized where I should be. But I was like, nope, this isn't it. And the whole time walking through there, I was like, this isn't right. This isn't right. It wasn't fun for me. It wasn't exciting for me. And I was like, I don't know why I did this. Just because a bunch of other people wanted me to go. I was like, okay, I'll go so I can be part of the crowd. Well, I know now that I'm separate from that crowd. I'm in a different crowd. I'm in a different family. This one's even a little more subtle. And I've tried to fix this here over the last couple of months. But just trying to scare somebody. The reason why I say I fix that is I do that to my wife all the time. I could just walk around the corner and she'd be like, <gasps> and I'm like, I wasn't trying this time. I really wasn't trying this time. But there for the longest time, I would be like, oh, she went outside. I'll go stand behind the door, <laughs> wait for her to come in. And then I would just be like, boo. And she would jump and I would laugh and I would run so she didn't hit me. But, you know, <laughs> but it, it was... It was something that I found joy in, but then I realized after I started digging into some of this that that was a fear that I was putting into her for my enjoyment, and that's not right because we shouldn't have fear. We should be showing love. Amen. Amen. That's good work. So when you do something like that, so for example, we scare somebody, and if you're if you're out in the world and, you, and somebody scares us, this is even something even more subtle because of the way the words say, oh, you scared me half to death. That's another avenue that's opened up for him to get in. See, when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he came in us. All that fear, all those spirits that were inside had to leave. Amen. Well, now what are they trying to do? They're just trying to find a slight opening so they can get back in. And we can't let them do that. Amen. All right? We got to stand against that fear. Fear connects us to Satan the same way faith connects us to our Father. Amen. To act on fear is to act as if Satan is bigger than God. Amen. Satan cannot do anything to you apart from fear. Just like God can't do anything for you without faith. Okay? Now, I alluded to this a little while ago, but fearless can also be known as boldness. Boldness is defined as a confidence or courage. The quality of having a strong, vivid, or clear appearance. Now, where I'm going to go with this is you guys should have this. But I want to read part of this from our 2020 Word of the Lord for the expectation, the manifestation, and the transformation. And I'm going to tell you where this boldness is going to come into effect. In 2020, it'll be a time for action. No more sitting or waiting, but a time for acting and taking. Not taking back but taking of previous unheld territory and taking of those things that have been kept back for the people of God for this season. Amen. I looked over that, and I looked over that, and I looked over that, and I was trying to figure out how is that going to incorporate boldness. But when I read this, I started thinking about this is what we're supposed to do for the kingdom. We are to increase the kingdom. Amen. Very simple. I'm a math kind of guy, but very simple. If everybody in this room were just to get one person to come to church, we would double what's here right now. Right. I know pastor says, well, you know, we don't want to invite at least five people, but if you think in simple terms of math, one person that you invite to church that comes to church and stays with church just increase the kingdom by one, by two, by three, by four. And then all of a sudden, they start inviting people to church. And then the kingdom just keeps going and growing and growing. And it's a simple 
thing of just asking somebody to come to church. We've seen in announcements how different people's lives have been changed because somebody asked them to come to church. You know, Brother Darrell in the back was telling us, I had the guts to go. Well, first thing we got to do is just ask. That's the simple part. Now, why is that so difficult? I think one reason that we've not been able to decrease the kingdom of God like we wanted to is fear. When you, how do I approach them? What am I going to say to them? What should I ask? I heard a pastor here recently, and uh, we were over at, a, at Rusty and Amy's house, and we were watching TV and playing some games and just fellowshipping, and, and you know, we were watching uh, a pastor on, on, the, uh, on the YouTube, I believe is what it was, and he said something like this. I don't want to quote him, cause I, but I think it's along these lines. He says, if you're more concerned with what people say or think about you, rather than what God says or think about you, then that's idolatry. We watched that a couple of times. I know we rerounded it two or three times. I was like, wow, that, that might have been pretty strong there. Let's see what that is. And I had to look into it. Now, idolatry is the worship of something or someone other than God as if it were God. So, we must not care what others are going to think or say about us. It doesn't matter if they say no. Because if they say no to you, what have you done? You planted a seed. You started the process. So it might be somebody has to get asked five or six times to go to church, but people have to plant that seed. Because it might not be time yet for their harvest to come, but it will come. So the, we just have to make sure that we're planting the seed. So don't get, discour get discouraged if they blow you off or tell you to go downtown or whatever. <laughs> Ask. Okay? We have to be bold in believing that what God has said about us is true. We must be bold in believing God. Amen. Now, we need to use the boldness to ask others to join the family. We just simply need to go get them. We can't sit back and wait for people to come to church. Okay? Now, there's going to be those times that people try to find a church. Michelle and I were talking, and she gave me the dreaded, we need to have a talk. And I, we were out walking, and I'm like, what did I do? What? This is not good. And I think she saw the look on my face. She's like, oh, no, no, no. I was just going to say we need to find a church. I was like, oh. I'm like, man, I thought things were going really good. But then, oh, so that was kind of some relief that was pushed out of me. That was exactly right. That fear came on me, and I'm like, no, 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 no. We got to get rid of that. So, you know, we, we went through the process of looking at different churches and everything, and I'm just very thankful to God that we were going to go to a church that was out basically on, in Metcalf, 151st area, and we started going that way. And I got about a mile down the road. I was like, let's just, let's just turn. Let's just go to the other one. It's closer. If we don't like it, we can always go out that way. I just don't want to drive that far. I wasn't thinking about where to really get the word. I just didn't want to drive that far. <laughs> so we pull up, and we're outside, and we're sitting there. And I, I don't recall who was sitting there, but we sat there for probably 10 minutes. We're like, you know, are we going to do this? Are we going to do this? And they're like, come on, come on, come on. I'm like, all right, let's go. So, and as pastors alluded before, I was that uh, Sunday morning. I was a schmo. I was the last one in, and I was the first one out pastor had told me one time that he had he was planning on coming up and talk to me but every time he get done with the service it was like god bless you and then <laughs> gone i was just out of here and i was like that i had the baby in my arm i had the carriage and i was like come on we're gonna go but i'm so glad that we made that u-turn because the spirit told us that's not where you need to be this is where you need to be fed that had nothing to do with what i was going to say but it just felt right at the moment to go with through with that so we must understand that we have boldness in us. Why do we have boldness in us? Well, Jesus lives in us. If we look at Philippians 4.13, and I know this is a familiar verse for everyone, but those that are not familiar, we're going to read it anyway. Philippians 4.13 
Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. I can do all. All things through Christ which strengthens me. Christ is in me. Christ is in you. Yes. You. 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 Okay? So there should be no reason why we can't have the boldness just to go talk to somebody about who's inside. Amen. Amen. Let me give you another example. Let's go over to John, 1 John 4. 1 John 4. We're going to read a couple of verses here. I want to start in verse 4. You are of God, little children, and I have overcome them. But greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. So, again, this states that who's in us is greater than anything that we're going to face when we go out there. Okay? Now, when we look at verse 8... I'm just looking at the back portion of it, but it says, God is love. Now, when we talked earlier, there could be no fear in God's love, no fear whatsoever. Now, if you look at the same chapter, we're going to look at verses 17 and 18. Herein our love made perfect, that we may have boldness. In the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Amen. Now, before I move forward, Amen. in the day of judgment, we have to have boldness. So we want to make sure that when we are standing in front of him, that we can tell him that we were bold enough to tell people about him and increase the kingdom. Because if he comes up and says, well, what did you do? mentioned you a couple of times, you know, just in passing. No, we want to be bold. We want to be bold. We want to be bold. We got to get them. Let's go to 18. Actually, before we go to 18, I'm going to read 17 in the Amplified. It says, in this union and communion with him, love is brought to completion and attains perfection with us, that we may have the confidence for the day of judgment with assurance and boldness to face him. Because he is in us, so are we in, the, so are we in this world. Now when we go to verse 18, I'll stay in the Amplified for right now. There's no fear in love. Dread does not exist, but full-grown, complete, perfect love turns spheres out of doors, and expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment. And so he was who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love, is not yet grown in love's complete perfection. So to kind of recap from earlier, we talk about God is not going to put something on you to punish you to get your attention. Okay? It is a complete love that is given to us. Amen. The boldness, obviously, when we have to give our account is when we're speaking in front of Jesus. But we got the opportunity when we speak about the wor- to the world about the wonderful love that he gives to us that's in Jesus, that we can go in front of him and say, I did this for your kingdom. Amen. I did this to bring people to you. Right. I want to read, let's go over to uh, Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy. And I want to read in chapter 31, verse 6, and then verse 8. We'll go with the King James, and then I'll go into the Amplified. Verse 6 says, Be strong and of good courage, 
fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is, it is that doeth that go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. So right there, back to the top, be strong and of good courage. Courage is the same thing as being bold. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. Them could be the folks that we need to go talk to. There's no reason to fear. Why? Because God's going to be with us and he's not going to let us fail. Amen. Verse 8. And the Lord, he it is that doeth go before thee, and he will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Now, if you look at those verses in the Amplified, we'll go back to verse 6 in the Amplified. It says, be strong, courageous, and firm. Fear not, nor be in terror before them. For it is the Lord, your God, who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Verse 8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will march with you. He will not fail you or let you, f let you go or forsake you. Let there be no cowardice or flinching. But fear not. Neither become broken in spirit, depressed, dismayed, or, or, and unnerved with alarm. My family, there's a choice that has to be made. Are you going to choose a life of fear, anxiety, terror, and darkness, which is a form of worship to Satan? Or are you going to choose to go to the light and the love that only God can provide. Amen. Amen. To me, that's a simple choice. Yeah. A very simple choice. Say this with me. Father, Father I, choose I choose not to fear. I choose your love. I choose, your love. I choose to worship you. I choose to worship you. From, this day forward, From this day forward, I will not fear. I will, be bold, I will be bold, and I will follow you. And I, will follow you. I will be bold, I will be bold and, share and share your love with others. I will serve you only, I will serve you only. in the name of Jesus. Name Hallelujah. Of Hallelujah. 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 Well, I want to thank everybody for your time. I hope that you got as much out of it as I was getting out of it because it was just building my <laughs> spirit as I was... I was bringing it forth. I was like, well, this sounds good. This is great because the Lord is telling me what to say. I was super excited. So I want to remind everybody that this Saturday, for the ladies that are in the house, ladies meeting, Living Proverbs 31, will be at 6 p.m. here at the church. So I want to just remind everybody, if you can attend, if you're at home, please show up. I know that Pastor Michelle is going to have great words for us. And then, of course, Pastor Michelle is scheduled to be with us this Sunday as well on our normal time. So if everybody would stand with me, we're going to say our vision. The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this message. We would love to hear from you. If you have a prayer request or want to share how this message has helped you, send us an email at main at buildfaith.net. This message and many more materials are available to you free of charge, can be found at buildfaith.net or at any of our location media stores. As always, keep the switch of faith turned on and build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God.